the communion table mic going to be used by any? I'll do. Good morning. We welcome you to our 9 o'clock worship service here at Washington Street on this uh, beautiful rainy day uh, after lots of dry weather, uh, rain, and blessings from God are uh, always, always so meaningful to our lives. Thank you for being here. If you haven't filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to do that and pass it to uh, either aisle that's nearby, and um, the ushers will come through in just a moment and pick those up. Thank you for being here to worship with us on this Lord's Day. If you'd like to, let's stand as we sing our first song. Mm. There is beyond the azure blue a
Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this day. We're thankful for last night's rest, for giving us another day on this earth to serve you in a better way. Father, we're thankful for this morning that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to come before you, to worship you, to honor you and praise you in this worship of service. May we exclude the things of our everyday thoughts and concerns and focus our attention on you. And may our focus on you and our worship to you be, to you be acceptable and pleasing to you. Father, we come to this building not just to worship you. We come to this building as a house of refuge, away from the sins of this world. Father, we know that we are not perfect. We are human. We make mistakes. Sin eats at our heart every single day. The devil ensures that. And Father, we come before you not as perfect human beings. We come before you as those who are seeking you always, to seeking your your power, your grace, and your mercy, and we're thankful for that, but also, Father, to lay out our arms to those that are in need, for those that are hurting right now in, in so many ways that we may or may not know of. We ask, Father, that if there's anyone here this morning that is in that any kind of pain at all, that we can extend our arms to them and, and hold them in our arms and, and offer our, our love, offer our passion, and Father, also to offer grace and mercy to those who have strayed. Father, thank you, Father, for this time again. Thank you for this day. Help us always to be mindful of what is in your word, because through your word we know the Holy Spirit inspires all of us. Thank you for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the ways he came to this earth and taught us many things, but he also offered his life as that sacrifice for each and every one of us, that through that sacrifice, we may have heaven with you forever. Forgive us, Father, when we sin. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. As we begin to focus our minds on the Lord's table this morning, what is Jesus' sacrifice if it's not faithful love toward his creation? Let's sing. Faithful love flowing down from the Lord.
Good morning. It's good to see each of you again and us to be gathered around this table once again in doing the Lord's Supper. And uh, just by way of a reminder, the, you have the cup there as an option if you're more comfortable using that little kit that's there, the Lord's Supper kit that's in the rack in front of you. Uh, feel free to do that. I wanted to read a passage this morning from Colossians, the book of Colossians. It helps me sometimes when I'm participating in the Lord's Supper. It helps me get my mind right. And uh, this is, I'm going to read this from the easy to read version. And this is Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 down through 23, if you would like to follow in your Bible. Colossians chapter 1, 13, beginning. God made us free from the power of darkness. And he brought us into the, the kingdom of his dear son. The son paid the price to make us free. In him we have forgiveness of sins. No one can see God, but the son is exactly like God. He rules over everything that has been made. Through his power, all things were made, things in heaven and on earth, seen and not seen, all spiritual rulers, lords, powers, and authorities. Everything was made through him and for him. The Son was there before anything was made, and all things continue because of Him. He is the head of the body, which is the church. He is the beginning of everything else, and He is the first among all who will be raised from death. So in everything, He is most important. God was pleased for all of Himself to live in the Son, and through Him, God was happy to bring all things back to Himself again, things on earth and things in heaven. God made peace by using the blood sacrifice of his son on the cross. At one time, you were separated from God. You were his enemies in your minds because the evil you did was against him. But now he has made you his friends again. He did this by the death of Christ, suffered while he was in the body. He did it so that he could present you to himself as people who are holy, blameless, and without anything that would make you guilty before him. And that is what will happen if you continue to believe in the good news you have heard. You must remain strong and sure in your faith. You must not let anything cause you to give up the hope that became yours when you heard the good news. That same good news has been told to everyone on earth, and that is the work that I, Paul, was given to do. And so this morning, as Paul reminds us of the blood and the body, and, and that's how Christ brought us or God brought us back to himself through Christ and his sacrifice this morning as we take this bread and this cup help us to let's go back and remember what God's done for us let's pray our father we thank you so much for the blessing of your son that you've given us to reconcile us to you through the cross and Father, this morning we humbly come before you and we, we remember that sacrifice of his body that was broken for us. And as we partake of this bread this morning, Father, help us to remember and to reflect and to realize that it's, it's because of what he did that we can have this relationship with you and this hope that we have. Thank you again, Father. May we partake of this in a way that brings honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
as Colossians 1.20 said, and through him God was happy to bring all things back to himself again, things on earth and things in heaven. God made peace using the blood sacrifice of his son on the cross. Let's, at this time, take of the cup and remember that blood offering. Let's pray. Father, again, we come to you and we remember what Christ has done for us. And he lovingly gave his all for us, going to the cross, a, a, most, a most cruel and horrible death. And in dying, he shed his blood. His, and that blood, of course, is what gives us hope. And that paid the price for our sins. And it brought us back to you. And Father, we, as, as we partake of this cup this morning and, and uh, drink this uh, juice, we remember the blood that was given for us. Father, again, we thank you. We love you. And as we do this, help us to honor you and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we continue our thanks to you for our physical blessings. Father, we know that we're blessed far more than we deserve, and we pray that we never forget that. At this time, we're thankful for the opportunity to give back a portion of these blessings to you. We pray that we do so in a manner well-pleasing. Christ, let me pray. Amen.
exciting to begin a new series of lessons today. Uh, going back to Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, Jim is going to begin a series of lessons. We sang earlier about Jesus on the cross and in his life being a faithful love for us. God has always been a faithful God. In fact, it was about 500 years or so before Jesus was on the cross that, G that God was demonstrating his faithfulness to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and those, that generation of time. Of course, God's always been faithful to his people. Um, I, was, I thought of this song as we begin this study of Ezra and Nehemiah because in Nehemiah 1, chapter 11, Nehemiah's got a big task ahead of him, and he prays these words in verse 11 of Nehemiah chapter 1. Lord, let your ear now be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of the servants who take joy in fearing your name. And it's through the grace of God that we today join that prayer in those people who have always cried out to this eternal God. If you'd like to, let's stand and sing this short song. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord. morning, church. Good morning. It is good to be together this morning. It's good to see everyone. Um, as you are turning in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 1, I have just a couple of things to mention. First of all, I want to take a moment and introduce to you a wonderful family. If you haven't had a chance to meet the Sloan family, J.D. and Brittany uh, have... Um, expressed an interest in being a part of our church family, and their lovely children, John and Charlotte, are right down here to my right. Would you guys maybe stand and give a little, you know, royal wave or something like that, if you haven't met? <laughs> there you go. Very good. Very good, Brittany. Uh, we are so glad to have you guys with us. They come to us from Murfreesboro, moved to town about a little over a year ago, I guess, and then COVID hit, and they have uh, been uh, regular visitors among us for the, the last uh, good bit, and we're glad to call them family today, and uh, welcome, guys. And, uh, um, I, I got a note this morning just a few minutes ago from Ricky Pierce. Ricky and Joe Cummins, as you know, are in Honduras. They flew out on Thursday and arrived. It's not an official uh, brigade this year. It's just the two of them, but they are, it sounds like, they're getting as much work done as normally it takes 15 or 20 of us. So uh, they have already put a roof on a, uh, on a building in Contaranas. Let's see, where's my email? He, he mentioned several things. He said this morning um, they, are, they ha are having worship in the three different locations where or three different congregations meet there. I think Ricky is preaching at each one of those, and so he said, you know, uh, say a short prayer for him this morning. They are uh, worshiping at 10 and at 2 and at 5 today, maybe, <laughs> he says. So if you've ever, ever, ever been uh, with us on a trip, like you understand completely what, what he means by that. Um, uh, he, he says that uh, they have a new brother in Christ. Luis is a member in Contaranas and was baptized uh, last evening, Ricky says. He says the river is cold, by the way. But uh, we're uh, very glad to, to hear of that. Brother Ricardo, who works with uh, our folks down there, is very sick right now. Not COVID, but very sick and would like for us to pray uh, for him. And so uh, as we lead the 
the closing prayers and, and pray in, in Bible class a little bit later. Keep Ricardo in your prayers. Um, and they look forward to, to being back with us and, of course, sharing with us uh, how the work is going there. Uh, Ricky will not be here this morning for class. And so for class this morning, if you guys would meet together, pray together, and if some, one of you has a word to share, you can do that. But uh, I don't believe he made arrangements for uh, a teacher. Um, I know that our young people are excited about camp. Camp is uh, this week. I think they're leaving on Thursday. Is that right? Sounds, sounds right. <laughs> 16th. Okay. Whatever the 16th is. So uh, uh, that's going to be coming up pretty soon. So uh, be, be thinking about our young people on that. And I also wanted to say thanks to the Hamptons. Uh, thank you guys for once again hosting a wonderful Sunday evening celebration last Sunday night. If you were out there, you know, beautiful weather, beautiful fireworks. Everybody went home with the same number of fingers and toes, uh, as far as I know, that they came with, and there were no ER visits, as far as I know. So that's always a good fourth in my book. I do want to invite you this morning to the first chapter of Ezra, and I want us to begin with the text. The word of the Lord. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and He has appointed me to build a temple for Him at Jerusalem in Judah. And any one of His people among you, may His God be with Him, and let Him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. We're going to come back to that text here in just a moment. Uh, I I think that it is going to be years before we as a people fully realize the extent to which the age of COVID has affected all of us. Uh, I'm not talking about just in terms of health, but in all of the ways that we have been affected these past more than 15 months now, and especially as it relates to church. I know in the circles that I run, ministers and church leaders are all talking about the same thing, talking about what the post-COVID church is going to look like. And and and, and everybody kind of has the same questions. The bottom line is nobody knows. And even the uh, so-called church growth gurus who write books and publish papers, they don't know. They are offering only hesitant prognostications of uh, of what the future is going to look like. The bottom line is nobody knows, and the questions are all the same. Is everybody going to come back? Uh, What do we do? How do we reach out to those who haven't yet? Uh, Is it okay to relax some of the restrictions? Are we being responsible enough? And on and on and on. And these are the same questions that that everybody that I talk to in ministry is considering. How do we navigate this? It it has been such a difficult time. Uh, And I've said before, I don't think there has been a more difficult time, at least in my time in ministry, uh, for church leaders to know exactly how to navigate. Decisions have have had to be made. Uh, and they know that at every decision, not everybody's going to be happy, you know. Somebody's going to be upset about that. Uh, but, and, and, I, and, I so, and I've said this, I so appreciate this family, this faith family, uh, for, who has weathered this uh, with grace and understanding. I think for the most part, we have. Um, so now we're a year out. Uh, we're a year out. Cases are down, thankfully, uh, not over. I'm still hearing of some. Cases are down. Uh, vaccines are available. People are going back to work. Uh, businesses are open. Churches are open. And the Chick-fil-A dining room is open. So praise God about that. Um, uh, but, but everybody's asking the same questions. What's next? What's next? 
And I know that some are saying, well, let's just get back to normal. Let's just get back to the, thing, to the way things were. And it probably comes as no surprise to you that I am not one of those people. I am not one of those people. In fact, I, 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 I stand as kind of a counter voice. I want to be kind of a counter voice to that mentality for a couple of reasons. One, I don't think it's possible. I think so much has happened. I think that there has been such a significant disruption in a lot of different ways to the way things were that it's really impossible for us to get back exactly to where we think we were. But more importantly than that, I don't think it's preferable. I don't think it's preferable. Uh, those who say, let's just get back to normal, I think they've forgotten what normal was like. The way things were. Let me just remind you. There, there was a report, a 2018 report, uh, that came out studying churches of Christ specifically that... that revealed the rate at which people are leaving churches of Christ has accelerated markedly over the previous three years, from 2015 to 2018, at a rate of approximately 5%, uh, by far the largest decrease in membership since records have been kept. Uh, Churches of Christ lost an average of 930 members every month for the previous 18 years. So this came out in 2018. From 2000 to 2018, that would be the statistic. Uh, five churches of Christ, on average, closed their doors every month. And if we look at just the previous three, month, three years, that rate has increased to nine churches closing their doors every month, every year. And what's more, the number of young people, children, and teens has shrunk by more than 20% since 1990. So that's not to frighten you, just to remind you, these were pre-COVID numbers. This was, this was normal 15 months ago. See, I don't think normal was working very well. Uh, and, and so my goal is not to get back to normal, as I've been saying, get back to better. But that's not just a, that's not just a, a slogan. Just getting back to normal, I don't think, is going to be enough. I believe it's time for God's church to really rethink and to reimagine what it means to be God's church in the 21st century. And to do that, I want to invite you back to the 6th century B.C., to the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. You wondered when I was going to get back to that, right? I want us to, get back, I want us to go back to, to the story of Ezra and Nehemiah for some very specific reasons. I, people think that I, you've read these books before, and, and, and I imagine a lot, of, a lot of you may think that these books are about rebuilding, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding uh, the city, rebuilding... Uh, rebuilding the, the city of Jerusalem, rebuilding the wall. But I don't think that's the point of Ezra and Ezra, Nehemiah. Not at all. Ezra and Nehemiah is about rebuilding a people. Actually, I think more precisely, restoring a people. Which is why I'm uh, calling this series Restoring a People. At the time of Ezra, my, uh, of, of Ezra, Ezra, my, <laughs> How many times am I going to say that over the next couple of weeks? Uh, at the time of Ezra, chapter 1, in 538 B.C., God's people had been through a tremendous ordeal. Uh, an ordeal that makes what we've gone through the last 15 months pale in comparison. I don't even want to try to draw that parallel. I don't, don't hear that this morning. But it was an ordeal that completely disrupted, even decimated, I think it's not too strong of a word, decimated their lives. Not only physically, but spiritually. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. At a time when, when things seemed to be about as bad as they could be, God, who had never given up on His people, God moved in a mighty way. He used not only two very strong and godly leaders, Ezra and Nehemiah, but also a pagan king 
and any number of other uh, individuals to bring about hope and restoration to his people, to a people who were hurting. And it wasn't about building back what they had. It was about restoring them to where they should have been to start with. Restoring their relationship with God. It was, it was about making them, about remaking them, really into a stronger and more faithful people than they had ever been. That's the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. So Ezra and Nehemiah really is one story. I keep, I keep talking about Ezra and Nehemiah. It really is one story. For centuries, these two books were regarded as, as one book, as one story. It looks like it's written by the same author. Same author, by the way, who wrote First and Second Chronicles. Very, very similar in style and... Uh, in, in writing. Uh, it, it looks like he was written, obviously, sometime after the return from exile. Um, Seventy years before chapter 1 was written. In 589 B.C., and history confirms this, forces led by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which was the world's superpower, Babylon invaded Israel's southern kingdom of Judah, sacked Jerusalem, burned down the holy temple of God built by Solomon, and destroyed the city. And it was a defeat and a devastation that forever changed them as a people. Survivors were rounded up, as you know, the most healthy among them, young men, were shipped off to Babylon to live in exile. Young men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can go and read his story in the book of Daniel. They were shipped off to live in Babylonian captivity. And to get a sense of what, uh, of what it was like, we have Psalm 137. Let me just read Psalm 137. I, you know, you can read the history book, but Psalm 137 is, 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 is like a, a first-hand account, a rendering of what it was like to live as an exile in Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, Jerusalem. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us to sing, uh, asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of Zion? Uh, while, uh, songs of the Lord, while in a foreign land. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I don't remember you. If I don't consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is he who repays you for what you've done to us. Happy is he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. You can hear the despair in these words. You know, most of the Psalms, <laughs> most of the Psalms are cherished by Christians. We, we write them on walls, we, we, we put them to music, we read them in devotional time. This one's a tough one. There's not much good in this Psalm. But it gives you know, depictions of the atrocities, the, the cruelty. Sing your songs of Jerusalem while they're living in exile, being captive slaves. Tear it down, they cry. Tear it down. But it gives us a sense of what they lost. Judah had lost their king. They had lost their country. They had lost family. They had lost... They'd lost their temple. And we probably can't hardly appreciate what that, what that meant to them, what the temple of God, the temple of God is where God's presence literally dwelt. It's where they came to worship. It wasn't just a building. 
for them. God's presence was there. And it had been burned and destroyed and they had been removed from it. It was as if they'd lost God. It had to have been how they felt about it anyway. As if they were without God, that God had abandoned them. Now we know from our vantage point, God had not abandoned them, but He was teaching them something. He was teaching them. This was no mere political defeat, right? Uh, it, this had been judgment from God. Judgment that the prophet Jeremiah had written about. In fact, if you go back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 25 tells us that for 23 years, Jeremiah preached the word of the Lord to Judah. For 23 years, day in, day out, preached the word of the Lord to Judah, and the people did not listen or pay attention. In fact, fact, not just Jeremiah, but, but prophet after prophet had been sent to them again and again, and they didn't listen. They didn't turn from their ways. Listen to to Jeremiah chapter 25, picking up in verse 5. You read this whole chapter. But picking up up in verse 5. Turn now, each of you, from your evil ways and your evil practices. Remember, this is written to Judah, not to Babylon. Judah was a people of God. They were God's chosen. Israel, the northern kingdom, had long since been, been, been evaporated, been destroyed by, by previous forces. Judah had remained. God's talking to Judah. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, and you can stay in the land the Lord gave to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not follow other gods to serve and to worship them. Do not provoke me to anger with what your hands have made. Then I will not harm you. Why what their hands have made? Because their hands had made idols of wood and of stone, clay, false gods that they were worshiping instead of the one true God, Yahweh. And I know we can kind of snicker today, kind of chuckle at the foolishness of worshiping rocks and wood. But just think about how many times we choose something other than God, over God. How many times we in our lives choose things of the world, worldly things, instead of God. I like what Kyle Eidelman uh, has written, wrote years ago. Idolatry is not a problem today, he said. It is the problem. It is the problem. Every other problem that we have in our world stems from the sin of idolatry because it's the sin of placing something other than God in your life. Replacing God. Anytime we put something in the place of God in our lives, that's an idol. Anytime we we give something time over time with God, it's an idol. Anytime we give our hearts to something over God, it's an idol. I think he's right. So we chuckle. Jeremiah went on to explain in this section exactly what was going to happen to them. He lays it out there pretty clear. God was going to use the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, he calls him by name, to carry them into captivity where they would stay for exactly 70 years. Jeremiah had been called a weeping prophet, has been called a weeping prophet, for good reason. He had a lot to weep about. He didn't have good things to say to his people. And you gotta, you got to imagine that as he preached day in and day out for 23 years to Judah, that his heart broke. Because the things he was saying were true. They had done evil and wickedness. They had followed after other gods and brought harm to themselves. And they'd been warned over and over again by the prophets. And still they refused. They were guilty. 
and they knew it. And of course, what Jeremiah told them would happen is exactly what happened. For 70 years then, the Jews lived in Babylonian captivity, in exile. At the end of Jeremiah 25, though, there's a glimmer of hope. Actually, in verse 12, I said the end. In verse 12, he says, When these 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord. I will make it desolate forever. I will bring upon uh, that land all the things I've spoken against it, and all that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations great kings, and I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. You ever notice how in the Bible every superpower eventually falls? Usually under the weight of its own arrogance and selfishness. God usually sees to it. And so the king of Persia came to power, or the kingdom of Persia came to power seceded Babylon, with it a new king, a new administration, and a light at the end of the tunnel for Judah, a new hope. And it's there in 538 B.C. that our story of Ezra and Nehemiah begins. It's the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. I'm going, to, I'm going to read the first few verses there again. I read earlier. The first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, Jeremiah notice, notice that. Jeremiah had prophesied what was going to happen. It happened, and then God said what happened was in order to fulfill the prophecy that Jeremiah spoke. God is in control here of this story. God is in control of these events as they are unfolding. They are unfolding as God is ordaining. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now that's an interesting statement in and of itself. Persia was just as pagan as Babylon was. History doesn't remember them much better than Babylon. It would be, it'd be centuries later, Alexander the Great would come through and conquer Persia. Persia would get their due. But God still moved in the heart of this pagan king to accomplish his purposes for his people. And this is what, uh, what, he, what he said, make a proclamation. And this is the, this is the proclamation. This is what the pagan king said, right? The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me the kingdoms of the earth, and He's appointed me. Cyrus recognized Yahweh? He did. He recognized that the Lord, the one true God, had, had given him this special task to build a temple for him in Jerusalem and Judea. And any one of his people among you, this was going out to the exiles living in captivity in Babylon, now Persia, all of those who are living among you, may, may his God be with him and let him go back to Jerusalem and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. We'll look next week uh, about that return. Isn't that interesting? After all that, God moves in the heart of this pagan king not only to allow the exiles to leave Babylon, to free them from captivity, but then he goes about restoring the temple of God, clearing the debris out of the streets and rebuilding the city, and most importantly, the temple, restoring the worship, restoring the worship, uh, the worship of God. The one true God. It's an incredible story. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I went over the next few weeks, uh, four or five weeks, to, to take a deeper dive into this story of Ezra and Nehemiah and to watch this restoration as it unfolds. 
Of course, it didn't happen overnight. It, didn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't without its challenges. It wasn't without its opposition. But it's in, in, an inspiring story of a people not just being restored to their homes, but being restored to God. And of course, I believe God is still at work restoring His people. I believe He wants His church to be strong. I believe He wants His people to be vibrant in faith and active in mission. And I believe that that whatever the experiences of the last 15 months were uh, and, and have done to us, God wants for us to come out stronger and more faithful and more alive in the Spirit than we were ever before. And I don't know if, I'm not trying to suggest anything about COVID. I don't know if COVID was judgment from God. Don't, I'm not going there. I'm not, I don't have insight into that. I'm not going to speak for God. But I do think God wants us to learn something through all the experiences that we go through. And He wants for us to be a strong people. He wants for us to be a vibrant people. He wants for us to be a restored people. And it's not about building back Uh, What we had, it's about restoring us to where we need to be. And that's our challenge. Where do you need to be? Three real quick biblical New Testament principles that I think stand out to me here. Number one... God is faithful. We sang about it. God is a faithful God for good and for judgment, right? Uh, the, The word delivered through Jeremiah was no idle chatter. God meant what He said, and He followed through on what He promised. And that was true with judgment as well as with salvation. He promised through Jeremiah both, and He delivered both. I think about what... uh, Paul wrote to the Philippians. God doesn't doesn't give up on His people. He doesn't uh, give up on His promise. When when Paul was writing to the Philippians, he said, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul knew God was faithful. And if God's going to start something, He's going to finish it. God has started something in us. Just as he has not given up on, just as he did not give up on Judah, he has not given up on us this morning. And if you're here this morning and you can do this and you can feel a pulse, God's not done with you yet. He is still working. He is still working in your life. He is still working in the life of this church. I'm confident of that too. But more than that, number two, God is serious about His plan for His people, and we need to be too. God is serious. The New Testament has some Jeremiah's. Did you know that? Those like Apostle Peter, who wrote to warn Christians uh, about the word of the Lord and how the same word that spoke the heavens and the earth into existence also spoke judgment. Look what Peter wrote. 2 Peter chapter 3. He said, By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. These are, this is apocalyptic language. This is, this is, this is language about judgment. Peter reminds us of judgment still to come, and he doesn't want us to think that just because it seems like it's been a long time that God's forgotten what He promised. Maybe it is that it's been a long time because He's giving us ample time to repent. To turn from our sins. So that at the coming of the Lord, 
will not be a day of judgment for us, but a day of salvation. We need to be serious about that. God's serious about it. But thirdly, we need to live accordingly, right? He goes on in 2 Peter. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? This is his point. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. The elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. And bear in mind that the Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with wisdom that God gave him. Peter and Paul didn't always see things alike. In the very next verse, he kind of mentions Paul again. They didn't always see things alike, but I think they saw those things alike, right? How then should we live accordingly? Church this morning, restoration begins with repentance. It begins with turning away from our sins, acknowledging them before God, turning away from them, seeking God. Are you where you need to be this morning? Mark's going to come and lead us in an invitation song. If we can encourage you, if you, need to, if you need to surrender to Christ this morning, where that forgiveness is found through His blood and the waters of baptism, we want to encourage you to do that. We can pray with you and encourage you in any way. Won't you come while together we stand, together we sing? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to this end of this period of worship, we pray that everything done this morning was not only acceptable, but well-pleasing in your sight. Lord, as we humbly bow before your throne, we do so with a spirit of thanksgiving. We're so thankful for the Sloan family for choosing to worship and labor here with us. We're so thankful for the baptism in Honduras of Brother Luis but we also pray that you'd be with Brother Ricardo in Honduras, that you'd lay your healing hands upon him. We're so thankful for Ricky and Joe and the sacrifice of their time and their effort in Honduras. We pray that much good is done down there in your name, and we pray that you'd keep them safe and return them back home. Lord, as we go out into the world, 
a world that would tell us that good is evil and evil is good. We pray that we could be the light that this world needs. That's what you call the church to be, Lord. Pray that we would be bold in proclaiming your truth, that we would be bold in shining a light on sin, that we would be loving and caring for those who are in need, that we would be the first people to go in when there is a need. We pray that numerical growth comes, but more importantly, that spiritual growth comes. Without that, everything else is pointless. Lord, we pray that we would focus on your word, that we would never compromise on your truth, and that we would be Christians that you are proud to bear that name. We pray that you'd be with us this week and bring us back at the next appointed time. In your son's holy name, amen.